Okay, well, there we are. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, our next quarterly update uh, for uh, ACC, our quarterly webinar series. Uh, I'm Dr. Brendan Mulvaney. I'm the director of the China Aerospace Studies Institute, uh, calling from here in DC at National Defense University, uh, and of course, down from uh, Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. Uh, so this, uh, this quarter, we're focusing on Taiwan and its neighborhood. Uh, and we've got, uh, as always, an all-star panel lined up here. And so what we'll do is uh, we'll turn it over, over to each of them for 10 to 15 minutes of uh, introductory comments, uh, laying the background and, and uh, how they see things from their particular vantage point. Uh, and then we'll open up to uh, questions and answers after that. Uh, as always, on behalf of our co-host, uh, ACC, uh, you know, I'd like to welcome you, say thank you for uh, participating in this. Um, they have a, a good group of people over there that uh, are working hard to make sure that uh, they are meeting the chief of staff's mission to get every airman up to speed on the China and the challenge that, uh, that we face with everything regarding that. So uh, without further ado, what I think we're going to do is we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Ian Easton. Uh, the speaker's bios, as always, are found on the, the CASI website through the tiny URL. Uh, I'll put that in the chat just in case somebody needs it, um, but uh, I won't waste too much time giving you their backgrounds because you can read about them in depth, but uh, they really are some experts in this field. Uh, and so with that, uh, Ian, I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's such a pleasure and a privilege to be on this panel addressing such an important topic at an important time. Uh, obviously, this is a uh, national security priority, arguably number one the United States and for our allies, uh, the Taiwan Strait area is a very vexing problem, not only for the military elements of it, uh, the, you know, we're looking at the People's Republic of China engaged in what is arguably the largest um, and most rapid peacetime military buildup the world has seen in, in at least 100 years. I mean, it is really remarkable if you turn back the clock and look at where they were as a military organization five years ago, 10 years ago, and where they were right where they are today. And where we are heading uh, and project that into the future. It's very worrisome. And it's very worrisome because we know from uh, Chinese doctrine and from uh, the stated intentions of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party leadership, that job number one for the PLA is preparing to invade and occupy China. That is uh, job number one. That is what they call their um, main strategic direction is the euphemism that the party uses for it. Uh, and it has been since 1993, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, the PLA kind of changed gears and started to focus on what it would take um, to go after Taiwan and to successfully invade and occupy while also deterring uh, and, if necessary, defeating the U.S. Uh, defense of Taiwan. Uh, obviously, that they had a very, very long way to go. Uh, they've been very focused on this mission, however. And so today, we are looking at a very different kind of uh, Chinese military. And what we're also seeing is as the, their military power grows, they have engaged in a um, remarkable campaign of coercion against Taiwan. And this manifests itself diplomatically. Uh, China is poaching Taiwan's diplomatic allies. Uh, around the world. So those few countries, it's about a dozen, just over a dozen countries that still maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Um, Beijing's going after them. Um, and even those countries that have robust, unofficial diplomatic relations with Taiwan, the way we do here in the United States of America, um, they're doing everything in their considerable power to undermine uh, that relationship, to make sure that our senior leaders don't talk with uh, Taiwanese senior leaders to make sure that uh, we don't visit each other. Um, and even last summer, uh, the State Department, and this is just an illustrative example, the State Department had a tweet that they released where they were, um, for the purposes of public diplomacy, talking about all the countries around the world that had received free uh, COVID shots, uh, Moderna shots from uh, the United States, and we've donated. And we've donated millions of, of free shots to Taiwan. And so they had that uh, in a tweet, in the name of Taiwan, the country, uh, Taiwan's flag, and then the number of shots that have been donated. Um, and then within uh, days, if not hours, that was deleted um, because according to US government guidance, we're not supposed to treat Taiwan like it's a country. 
even though, of course, even though, of course it is. Um, and so that, that was an example of this remarkable cam campaign of coercion that unfortunately it is effective and it really does limit our ability as a country to uh, grow a stronger partnership with the Taiwanese. Uh, and it puts us in a position where our senior officers um, do not often have a good relationship with their Taiwanese counterparts. Um, there's mistrust on both sides because of, of the nature of the relationship, the unofficial nature of it. Uh, and of course, we're limited in uh, that we don't have troops in country uh, other than a small handful of special forces. Uh, we don't do large scale military drills, exercises with the Taiwanese. The Navy doesn't do ship visits. The Air Force doesn't fly in uh, for friendly visits the way we would with any other ally or partner faces this kind of uh, existential threat. And for the Taiwanese, it really is existential. Uh, they have to prepare for a worst case scenario in which they are invaded uh, and, and the United States doesn't come to their rescue. So they have to prepare for that scenario. They also have to deal with um, what is I, th I think kind of euphemistically referred to, and it's kind of jargony, but the gray zone operations, uh, really what that is, is a long-term campaign of coercion and isolation. So Taiwan does not get to um, attend the World Health Assembly that the um, World Health Organization holds every year. And that's something that just passed, that despite a, a very large-scale effort, Taiwan was not, not allowed to be there. Um, and so they have to, to deal with uh, all that isolation. In the military realm, they have to deal with um, constant cyber operations, constant jamming, constant uh, deception, and disinformation operations. And of course, there's been a remarkable effort in uh, air activity in the Taiwan Strait uh, in really the past two years, since uh, January 2020, when Taiwan had its last presidential election. There has been a remarkable uptick. And there have been a lot of uh, activities in the air, at sea, uh, and in the electromagnetic spectrum against Taiwan. Uh, so the coercion is increasing over time. Tensions are rising, and the Taiwanese are um, in a position where they have to deal with the day in and day out sense of crisis. And there's that that constant sense of crisis that's there in, in Taipei, uh, in the small circles of, of folks who deal with these issues. Uh, and that really limits their ability to come up with a long-term strategy for how they deal with these issues and there are these policy debates that go on um, and they're, they continue to be unresolved. And, and I, I know Drew Thompson is here and, and he can speak to that, uh, the nature of that. Um, but these are some of the most difficult military planning challenges in the world today. Um, and so it's, it's you know, I, I've won issue. I, I think it is arguably the most structurally unstable flashpoint in the world. I think Taiwan is a country that is not treated as a country. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party increasingly seems uh, risk tolerant, and they are certainly building up uh, so that they will be ready to attack Taiwan if and when the orders come. And so that's the big, de the big debate here in Washington, as I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, is, is does Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party have a timeline? Is it 2027? Is it something else? Some experts would say it could be as early as 2024, 2025. Uh, and at the end of the day, nobody knows because nobody can get inside Xi Jinping's head. We don't know if he's already decided, if deterrence has already failed and he's decided that on, on X date, he's going to launch an attack. Um, and or if he keeps an open mind and he's waiting for conditions to change, he's waiting for more favorable conditions, he's waiting for his military buildup to be fully complete so that um, risks to, to him and to the partnership value minimized. Uh, or if he's waiting for something to change in US Taiwan policy. Uh, it really is unknowable. All we can do uh, is listen to, to what he says his actions and the actions of, of his military. Uh, and judging by both his rhetoric and China's really remarkable military buildup and their, the increase in tensions across in Taiwan, uh, we have every good reason to believe, uh, I think, that uh, this 
current sense of crisis is likely to match up further. And the prospects of, of peace in the Taiwan Strait, uh, continued peace in this decade are, are probably not looking great right now. Um, and so I'm just uh, throwing that out there to kind of set the scene. And I will now turn it on over to uh, my colleagues here on the panel. Perfect, thanks. That was a great scene setter. And uh, I should have said at the beginning, I'll say a, a blanket disclaimer for everyone that uh, everything's being said to here today is in a personal capacity, including by your theory, uh, and doesn't really? represent uh, the US government or any other institution or organization with whom they may currently be or previously be, or even in the future be affiliated. So uh, with that out of the way, <laughs> I'm getting some some violent head nods there. So with that out of the way, uh, we will turn it over to uh, to Lucas. Hi, well, first, uh, thank you all for, for having me. Uh, it's great to be here with some esteemed colleagues. Uh, and as well, always supporting Cassie, who does great work under Brendan's leadership. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, is take just a few moments to talk about uh, some conceptual differences in, in China and in, uh, U.S.-Taiwan perspectives as a way of then sort of talking just a little bit about a few of the uh, pressing concerns that I've detected from recent conversations with some Taiwan defense officials, some fairly senior ones. And my, my hope is that by doing that, uh, I'm injecting a little bit of the complexity of what the U.S. and Taiwan uh, are, are trying to navigate right now. So the, the first part of this that I wanted to, to mention is simply that, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter in some sense uh, whether or not uh, the PRC is right or wrong in their beliefs and their perspectives. They are still operating from those beliefs and those perspectives. And so it's important to understand them. So. Uh, as I describe this, I'm in no way supporting or trying to legitimate it. I'm just saying that uh, as we're thinking about what the proper actions and reactions from the United States and Taiwan are, we need to think about the, the Chinese perspective. And I think that one of the uh, you know sort of central points to the, the current tensions about Taiwan is how we define uh, changing the status quo. So you know, in all the sort of international agreements and bilateral agreements. Um, there is a constant back and forth between China and the United States, both publicly and privately, talking about who's trying to change the status quo and what the other one is doing about it. Uh, and so I think it is reasonable um, when China says over and over again that the United States and Taiwan are trying to change the status quo, that the United States is encouraging Taiwan separatists. Uh, I personally would disagree with that what's happening. But I think a lot of Chinese do see it that way. And I think the reason that they see it that way is their interpretation, their perspective of the status quo is that there is a slow but inexorable movement of Taiwan getting closer and closer to the mainland. Uh, and so therefore anything that the United States and others do that slows that down uh, is changing what the Chinese may interpret as, or some Chinese may interpret as the status quo. And so when we're thinking to some extent uh, about the turn, so, well, for one second, so that the other aspect of this is that um, like most countries, I would say that the CCP uh, would, would subscribe to all domestic, all politics are domestic uh, in the sense that ultimately what politicians and countries, national politicians are concerned about primarily or foremost uh, is the opinions of their own population. And even in China where there are not uh, democratic elections in the way that we would define it. Uh, I think that it's still incredibly important to consider domestic public opinion. And so while some of that can be controlled through censorship and propaganda, uh, that's not always the case, especially with current digital technologies. Uh, and so when we think about you know, how China has uh, maybe seized and has defined the status quo, as well as their goals for Taiwan, um, and even with some emphasis on timelines, even if it's not a specific 2027 or 2049, uh, it is sooner rather than later, uh, perhaps under Xi Jinping's tenure. Um, and so as we think about uh, what the US and what Taiwan and others are doing in order to sort of navigate the ability to maintain what, what we would see as the status quo, uh, which is that Taiwan, uh, the Taiwan question is not resolved through force or coercion, uh, we have to remember that our actions, uh, U.S. government actions in particular and OAIs, are, are going to be received by China inherently 
very differently uh, than the way we see it and vice versa. Um, and so when I've been talking to uh, some of these Taiwan MND reps, part of their concerns um, are very much focused on Ukraine. And I'm sure this is something we'll probably get to uh, further on in the discussion. But a, a couple of the sort of themes that I've picked up in the last couple of months from these uh, informal conversations, uh, one is a, is a, a probably a indirect reaction to many of, of the track two, two and a half, and three engagements between the United States and Taiwan over the last bunch of years. And that is uh, whether or not Taiwan has the will to fight and resist. Um, and there has been, I've, I've sat in some really interesting, heated discussions, and I, I think some of the other panelists here and, and Brendan have been on some of these, uh, where things will get fairly honest, um, where the United States uh, you know, interlocutors will say, you cannot expect the United States to, to fight for your country if you're not willing to fight for your country. Uh, and I felt like that was a very common theme in U.S. engagements with Taiwan for at least a number of years. Uh, and I think that it's starting to sink in because I've heard more and more, um, you know, Taiwan interlocutors saying, uh, do not worry, we have the will to resist. That doesn't necessarily mean it's true or untrue, uh, but it does mean that they are at least listening to, to U.S. concerns. Um, the other couple of things that, that I've picked up on this was, so in, in specific relation to Ukraine, uh, there's a, a fair amount of concern in Taiwan about the speed at which the United States and others will be able to help Taiwan should the PRC decide to use force. Uh, and this is, of course, partly uh, just a logistics distance um, problem, but it's also the fact that uh, in some cases, the arms sales to Taiwan that have been announced um, have been delayed in delivery in part because of uh, those weapons being re rerouted to the Ukraine conflict. Uh, and perhaps even more pressing is the idea, and this seems to be, I've heard this from a number of, of Taiwan uh, colleagues, that uh, the, the United States has been essentially training Ukraine since 2014 to, to resist uh, and to, to fight a stronger, uh, perhaps occupying force, uh, and has not been doing that for Taiwan. And so you know, I had not thought about that as a possible reason for, uh, you know, the concerns about whether Taiwan has the will to resist. Is they may not feel as properly equipped uh, and supported and in particular trained. Um, but it, going back to my original point, it makes it very hard to do that uh, when all the measures that the United States takes, China is going to interpret with, uh, you know, additional severity. Of course, China is also going to complain and protest um, louder than it may even feel. And as some of his friends on the, on the NSC have said, uh, especially in the early in the beginning of the Trump administration, there were things the United States government did with relation to Taiwan that several years before most China experts were like, that would be a red line. China would, would attack Taiwan and, and China protested loudly, but actually didn't do much. And so, again, when we get to the idea of deterrence, the question becomes, you know, looking at China and China's perspective of U.S. actions to deter what we see as the status quo, what is effective and what is less effective? What is provocative but not effective? Uh, and what is maybe less provocative but quite effective? In particular, and again, this is a, a point that was raised uh, in discussions with some Taiwan and M&D colleagues, uh, you know, there's been a recent emphasis and clarity in the U.S. government policy for weapon sales and support to Taiwan, focusing on asymmetric options. So you may have heard, you know, the porcupine theory, et cetera. Uh, Taiwan is the people I've talked to are absolutely tracking that. Um, but one of their questions, which is something that, that I had taken for granted, and I wonder if maybe this is something that might come up later in the conversation, is how effective are asymmetric capabilities uh, given to Taiwan at actually deterring China. You know, which ones might be the most effective? We, we assume that they will be, um, but are we looking, you know, at what phases? Are we looking at, you know, a, a crossing, the you know, landing on the beach, perhaps a protracted conflict uh, on the island itself? And so I, I think it warrants a little bit more uh, consideration in detail about what what is an effective deterrent for that matter, how effectively are we currently deterring China? Uh, and in what ways are we being most effective? Uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, thank you. Thank you for the time. I look forward to the discussion.
All right. Well, that was terrific. Uh, another great view from the uh, the other side of the strait, if you will. Uh, and now from uh, the bigger regional view, uh, Drew, although currently visiting Virginia, uh, is actually living in Singapore these days uh, and touches uh, all the surrounding countries uh, and the uh, has a pretty good sense of the pulse of what's going on in the region. So Drew, we'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you, Brendan. Um, uh, really glad to be here. This is a pretty great company to be in. And again, I, I'm 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 back home in DC area on leave, so I'm also uh, you know dressed somewhat informally, um, and living in an area where we have very poor uh, Wi-Fi. And I'm always struck when I come back at how poor U.S. infrastructure really is compared to what I see in Singapore, elsewhere in Asia, um, and and as we talk about competition with China. Um, you know, how are we actually performing? Um, I'd love to provide some feedback on and some some impressions on on Ian and uh, Lucas's remarks. I thought they were really spot on. Um, maybe I'll get to that to the end. Uh, Brendan asked me to focus on 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 the region and how they're looking at U.S. China and U.S. Taiwan issues. Um, and uh, I'll focus more on Southeast Asia because I think that's probably an area where you know, the participants uh, or, or the viewers here don't have quite as much experience. Uh, and I'll leave maybe a little bit on Australia and Japan in particular to the end. I think you've seen really pretty significant changes in Japan's approach to Taiwan, but I think it's important to understand Southeast Asia because um, there may be some, some potential misconceptions and I've detected uh, some um, uh, misperceptions on the part of uh, my my DoD colleagues and friends who who look at Southeast Asia from one view, and I contrast that with the view that uh, that I'm hearing from my Southeast Asian friends. So, so I think what 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 I see in Southeast Asia is that they have very substantial but essentially very exclusive interests with China and the U.S. They're separated, um, and they have relatively little interests in Taiwan itself. Uh, for the most part, Southeast Asian states want to avoid becoming entangled in U.S.-China competition. Uh, they see no benefits from it, uh, though they are actively hedging uh, between the two powers and will seek any benefits they can get. But by and large, I think they see more risk than reward from it. Um, so I'll take a look very quickly at some of the balance of regional um, uh, interests, both economic, political, and some of the security issues. Uh, bottom line, I, I don't think that, that Southeast Asian states are going to contribute to U.S. efforts to either deter Beijing from using force against Taiwan or uh, uh, some sort of uh, joint uh, coalition or collective security effort to uh, prevent Beijing from achieving its political objectives in Taiwan should it choose to use force. Um, so maybe I should caveat, in, in addition to Brendan's caveat, that, that these views are my own and, and don't reflect uh, employers. But, but another caveat I should make is that I'm, I'm making a tremendous mistake here by characterizing Southeast Asian states as a bloc. They are far from unified. Um, they are, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the, you know, the big hand little map syndrome. Uh, Southeast Asian states are incredibly diverse. They have very distinct and in many cases, very competing interests. Um, they have a very strong sense of sovereignty, and, and I think in some cases, the, the greater security threats that Southeast Asian states see in the region are their neighbors uh, rather than China or Northeast Asia. There's very little connectivity between Southeast Asian security challenges and Northeast Asian security challenges. So, so I'm doing I'm doing an injustice here by describing the region as a block, uh, but but I'll I'll, I'll just in the interest of time, I'll try to cover it as such. Um, so the most important takeaway is that China looms very, very large in the economic and the political perspectives of most Southeast Asian states. China is far and away the largest trading partner of each of the 11 Southeast Asian states. Uh, it's also worth really noting that intra-ASEAN trade, so between Southeast Asian states, the trade is very, very low. Uh, despite the fact that there's been an uh, intra-ASEAN uh, free trade agreement since 1992. So total trade within ASEAN 10 states is about 550 billion US dollars, which is almost the same as total trade between the region and China. Uh, the US is, is the region's second largest trading partner at about 300 billion. Uh, the EU is, is the third at uh, 220 billion. 
And Japan is the fourth at um, about 195 billion. By comparison, Taiwan, despite its small size, it is an economic um, uh, powerhouse, but it's still relatively small compared to the US, China, Japan. Uh, I think total, total trade between Taiwan and Southeast Asian states is about 90 to $100 billion, depending upon how you calculate it. So, so even though trade is not the entire measure of national security interest, it definitely colors how Southeast Asian states view their interests vis-a-vis -vis the US, China, and their sense of, of vulnerability uh, to, um, uh, to coercion, particularly by China. Um, the US and Japan are both much larger investors, foreign direct investors in Southeast Asia than China is, despite all of the hype. So China definitely has a very positive narrative about uh, things like the Belt and Road Initiative and its investments in high-speed rails. And that's very much part of the political discourse. But even though it, it has this dominant uh, spot in, in discussion in the region, it's still much smaller than the US and that's partly, and Japan, and that's partly because this is the difference between private sector investments, which don't represent state interests, and China's, which inexorably do. Um, President Tsai in Taiwan has sought to expand Taiwan's own foreign direct investment into Southeast Asia to increase uh, economic interdependence between Taiwan and Southeast Asia to, to essentially diversify a bit away from China. But I think the scale has still been relatively small. Uh, a, a certain number of, of Taiwanese companies have set up uh, a shop in, in Vietnam, uh, Malaysia for, for light manufacturing. Uh, but part of that is also driven by rising costs in China. Um, I, I would describe Taiwan's new southbound policy as, as being somewhat anemic. Um, I think even even if it had been very well funded, which it hasn't been, or have a big bureaucracy behind it, which it doesn't have, I think it would still face a, an uphill battle based on how Southeast Asian states perceive their, their interests, especially economic ones. Um, but from a national security perspective, again, politically, China is the dominant force. Um, Southeast Asian uh, elites perceive China as the rising power and the US as a declining one. I mean, China's narrative in this respect is, is quite successful. Um, every country in China accepts the one China principle. There's no uh, equivalent to the Taiwan Relations Act in any country in Southeast Asia. So Singapore is about the only country in Southeast Asia that has a significant security relationship uh, with, with Taiwan. Um, they send units to Taiwan to train, uh, but that's really defined more by, Taiwan, uh, by Singapore's self-interest. Uh, it's basically Singapore's lack of land for military training rather than a goal of, of collective security or mutual defense. So even though Southeast Asian states do have some interests in Taiwan, uh, as well as their own security concerns, I mean, if there, if there was a cross-strait conflict, Southeast Asian states would be very negatively uh, impacted. Uh, but, but I think those interests are really outweighed by uh, their, their dependencies on China. Um, and I think you can look at Southeast Asian states granularly uh, on, on a spectrum of favorability or dependency on China. Uh, on, on the China end of the spectrum, you have Cambodia, Laos, and increasingly Myanmar. Um, uh, and again, a lot of that is because of disinterest um, and rejection by the United States in many cases. Europe, um, sanctions against Myanmar since uh, the coup two, almost two years ago has really led to um, China stepping in and filling some of that vacuum. I think in the middle, you've got Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Brunei, Philippines, uh, Timor-Leste, and Singapore, uh, all in various degrees of hedging activity. Um, uh, they're trying to maintain as much leverage as they can uh, in obtaining maximum benefits from the US as well as from China. Um, very few of the Southeast Asian states are willing to stand up to China when their own interests uh, diverge with China, um, such as in the South China Sea, or uh, over things like fishing rights. Um, so, so even as they do occasionally stand up, like Indonesia, for example, has stood up and, and been quite outspoken about China's illegal fishing um, in, its, uh, in its EEZ, but it still seeks to gain economic benefits from China. So it's always very tempered in, in how they approach confronting China. Um, there, there is a very wholesale buy-in on this notion that that China's rising and, and that the US is, is declining. Uh, I, I call it the Thucydides trope. Uh, it, it's basically 
it mimics Beijing's narrative uh, that China is, is basically a victim of the US reaction to its rise. And then all of the, the confliction and, um, and, and contestation between the two is really driven by the incumbent power in the US seeking to prevent the rise of a challenger. And, and, and that, you know, it's really disingenuous, but it's really quite a popular uh, sentiment in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think at best, elites in Southeast Asia will acknowledge that the US is more powerful than China. It certainly has better soft power. I mean, nobody is lining up to send their kids to, to school in China. They are lining up to send their kids to school in the US, but they also note that China is still powerful. The US is still farther away than China and China is not going away. So the US has real challenge in ensuring that it's credible, it's committed and perceived that way. And then it demonstrates that it has staying power uh, because it's constantly being questioned, not only by Beijing itself, but by many elites uh, in the region as well. Very prominent local voices are openly challenging whether or not the US is here to stay when they can point to a China that's not going away. So this comes from a, uh, not just the trade, um, China's arms sales in Southeast Asia, also very considerable, particularly to Myanmar. Uh, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand as well. I mean, U.S. allies are increasingly dependent on China for arms. Um, the U.S., uh, I think during the Obama administration, when it um, uh, stopped selling some, some weapons, small arms primarily, to the Philippines, China stepped in and offered to, to replace the U.S. as a provider of particular capabilities. So, so this is an area where China's been opportunistic, but, but U.S. foreign policy is, is basically limited uh, the U.S.'s own um, uh, influence in the region. So another factor, of course, is you've got 30 million ethnic Chinese people living in Southeast Asia. Now, they are not necessarily, you know, uh, agents of influence for Beijing. They're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have an affinity for either Taiwan or China, uh, but they are a tool of leverage. Uh, many of them have business ties uh, and economic interests in the PRC. Um, and of course, average uh, ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia are, are wooed by the Chinese government, including the famous uh, United Front Work Department. So, so China is also very good at not just using these sorts of carrots and incentives, uh, but it's also very adept at using coercion and pressure against the smaller states in Southeast Asia, particularly economic coercion. And, and by and large, Southeast Asian states, because of their economic dependency, don't want to be um, uh, on, on the receiving end of Beijing's wrath. Uh, so Be Beijing has basically conditioned them to avoid challenging or confronting China. So, so, you know, the US of course has to be a counterweight to this if it's going to leverage its relationships in the region, particularly to tackle a problem like, like Taiwan. But I, I think honestly, we're coming up a bit short. Uh, the US is no longer able to, to, to capture elites in the region the way we did uh, during the Cold War. Uh, there's a steady drumbeat and demand in the region for greater U.S. economic engagement. Uh, they want much more U.S. economic presence, uh, but Washington is not meeting those expectations. The Indo-Pacific economic framework isn't taken very seriously. Uh, uh, it lacks what countries want the most, which is, uh, which is access to the U.S. market. They want the U.S. to join CPTPP, um, but everyone realizes that's not going to happen. Um, but again, it's not a coincidence that China's already applying to join the, the CPTPP, which the U.S. championed uh, and initiated. So, so, so this is a big problem, right? We're not meeting the expectations of countries in the region on their core issues. And the result is it's unlikely they're going to be terribly supportive on issues like Taiwan, where they have very marginal interests. Um, I think there's a couple of other own goals that the U.S. is currently um, perpetrating in the region. The the Biden administration's foreign policy emphasis on democracies versus autocracies is, is really counterproductive in Southeast Asia. Uh, the summit on democracy uh, uh, earlier this year was really a, a setback uh, uh, for US diplomacy in the region. Uh, and it really emphasized in Southeast Asia very diverging political interests between those states and the US. Um, I mean, ironically, that, that focus on democracy as a core principle for US foreign policy supports Taiwan, but it alienates some of our partners in Southeast Asia. So, I mean, bottom line of the 11 states in Southeast Asia, I'm pretty confident that none of them would take a stand against China in a conflict over Taiwan. Uh, the balance sheet of their interests makes it pretty clear. 
uh, a, a war over Taiwan obviously is a nightmare scenario for Southeast Asian states. Uh, and the discussion in the region is really not whether or not to support um, the US, uh, but really how not to get caught in the middle, how not to choose sides, how not to choose between Beijing and Washington. And, and not choosing sides might be the best case outcome. I think, I mean, economically, as I said, they're tethered to China and the US isn't helping to reduce that dependence. Uh, the possibility of US, EU, and Japan sanctions against China would, would magnify whatever economic damage a war uh, uh, would create. Um, and and they're, I think they're very unlikely to support US sanctions against uh, China. Uh, one can point out that Southeast Asian states aren't keen to impose economic costs on Beijing when their own interests are being trampled, such as by illegal fishing in, in their EECs. So I think for, for this audience, you know, for countries that currently grant the U.S. military some access, uh, I think a very good outcome in the event of a cross-strait conflict would be sustaining the same level of access. But I think it's very unrealistic that the U.S. will get more access in the event of a conflict. Even though we think we need it, I don't think they're going to be keen to give it. Um, it's also quite possible there's a worst case that that Southeast Asian states take uh, an aggressive neutrality position that basically would deny belligerent states the right of say overflight or passage in international straits. I think Indonesia in particular has already made some rumbling that, uh, that they would not support uh, US or Australian forces transiting uh, their airspace or, or seas if, um, if there were a Taiwan conflict. And, and again, I think this is also exacerbated in some cases by our own strategic communications. Uh, every time a U.S. defense official, um, I'm thinking of General Hyten, uh, but, but anytime a senior defense official or, or defense planner publicly states that the U.S. can't win its own war games against China, that, that really reinforces the perception that the U.S. is declining. So never mind the purpose of what U.S. war games are for and that you know, largely based on, on force development and budgets, the bottom line is that narrative that the U.S. cannot win militarily virtually assures that no states in the region uh, will provide U.S. access in the event of a conflict over Taiwan. Um, it's also worth noting that so much of the U.S. diplomacy in Southeast Asia isn't really geared towards gaining that access in the event of a conflict. It's geared towards a lot of other issues that are tangential to it. So uh, I, I think that China is really, at this point, really too powerful, too ambitious, too vindictive, um, uh, to, to, to really make Southeast Asian states consider coming to the U.S. aid in the support of, of Taiwan. Uh, their own interests in Taiwan are too low. Um, and again, U.S. credibility in the region is constantly being challenged in questions. So, so the prospects for building a coalition of Southeast Asian states to deter China from using force or denying Beijing their political gains, uh, if deterrence fails, is, is, is really quite low. Um, so, I mean, this, this has implications for our strategy in the region. Um, this has implications for our strategy with Taiwan um, and ultimately what we want to accomplish. And that has to be that has to be considered. As I said, Japan and Australia are completely different cases, but I thought I'll focus on, on Southeast Asia and we can take up these other issues in the, the, the Q&A. Um, and certainly I'd be happy to, to switch the conversation back to some of these key issues that uh, Ian and Lucas raised, um, including, I think Ian made a really good point about the lack of mutual trust, uh, the mistrust between Taiwan and U.S. senior officials. That's that's a major issue that's uh, difficult to challenge, uh, difficult to remedy. Um, and the other thing that struck me again, Ian's comment, you know, that you've got this this confluence of both China's capabilities and its intent. You know, these are two curves that are really crossing for the very first time. Um, and it creates an existential threat that I don't think is being met by a sense of urgency or crisis, either in Taiwan, where its defense spending has been increasing, but, but still somewhat flat, um, as well as in the US, where budgets are not shifting to uh, the Pacific as a priority theater, despite the drawdown in the Middle East. So happy to, to uh, discuss more about that in the Q&A. All right, well, that was a terrific tour de force of the, uh, the entire region. So. Uh, I think what I want to do is I'm going to add uh, some of my own personal thoughts on this, uh, and then we will uh, open it up to Q&A. There's already a question uh, in the Q&A. Lucas is working on that, but please uh, 
for those in the audience, if you have something you want to ask, please start populating that now and we will uh, we will get to them in turn. But first, uh, Drew mentioned one thing that uh, I want to make sure that uh, is emphasized and anyone who's watched these uh, webinars before has heard me talk about uh, the information domain and how China and the, PR, the PLA uh, look at information differently than we do. We see it as kind of a supporting thing. We see it as an adjunct and a, and a way to uh, support some of our uh, our other operations. Uh, the Chinese conceive of it as a domain in and of itself that is equal to air, land, and space, right? It is an information domain um, that has multiple facets that could be the supported domain, potentially, for example, think about conducting kinetic strikes to do something in support of an information domain operation. Uh, and it, this is part and parcel of just being good communists and understanding uh, that part of that is controlling the narrative. And that's what Drew was hitting on is, you know, hey, these states are listening to the narrative. They're listening to what the U.S. says. They listen to what China says. They listen to what Taiwan says. Uh, and increasingly, the PRC is able to engage in Southeast Asia specifically uh, and get their narrative across. Uh, and so they actually have entire systems uh, within the party that work in parallel with the state who ex export uh, their view and their views of the world and their, their positions and things. Uh, and we have to understand that the PRC is doing that now today, uh, have been doing it for a while, and we just are not at nearly as active uh, in getting our positions and our understandings out there uh, and trying to bring in some of the, uh, the international partners in the region specifically uh, to at least understanding our point of view, even if they, they do or do not uh, agree with it. And I will say that, that information domain extends uh, also domestically as well as internationally. Uh, and this goes along with just con you know, controlling the narrative. Uh, I was at a, a senior leader meeting here not too long ago in Ohio. And uh, after, you know, after one of the talks, somebody came up to me and asked me, did I really think that China cared that much about Taiwan? Uh, or was it possibly all just a, a big ruse? Right, and they wanted us to be uh, look over here at the shiny object while they wouldn't accomplish some sort of other uh, strategic uh, imperative somewhere else. And I, I had to say to him, no, this actually is something and it is really important to your average uh, PRC citizen. And the reason for that is that unlike here in the United States, unlike uh, in Southeast Asia and many free and democratic countries, uh, you know, China controls the education system. The party controls the education system. They control what people are taught uh, and part of that is this historical narrative. Uh, you know, the century of humiliation is part of that. Uh, but it is that Taiwan is part in an inseparable part of China. Um, and that is what everyone that goes through the communist education system, uh, which starts in kindergarten and continues to graduate school. So when I was in graduate school in Shanghai, taking communism from a communist, this was part of the narrative. Uh, and so it has been built into the psyche uh, of everyone that has gone through any kind of education since 1949, um, that Taiwan is an inseparable part. Now, forget about the historical you know, part that Taiwan has never been ruled by uh, the PRC, that Taiwan hasn't been ruled by the mainland uh, since at least the 1800s, right? Forget about all that. That's not part of the narrative. That's not what people in China and the mainland understand. Uh, but it is very important to understand that that is how they look at it. As Lucas said, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong or even true. It matters is that's what they think and that's how they perceive things. Uh, and so I'm I'm willing to be challenged on that. Or I'm willing to have uh, people, uh, you know, experts on the panel or in the audience uh, come back to me and say, well, maybe it is just a big uh, ruse operation uh, and that they really have uh, bigger designs on Belt and Road or something and they don't care that much about Taiwan, but that is in no way, shape or form uh, any indication that I got going through there. Uh, I wanted to talk about just, uh, you know, because this is a military crowd, uh, the options that we typically look at uh, are either an invasion scenario uh, or a blockade scenario. Either one of those will be a, a big lift for the United States to get there in time in order to have a direct contribution to that. Obviously a blockade would take over a longer period of, period of time. But in any case, we are absolutely reliant on the allies and partners that we have in the region, which goes back to Drew's talk, which goes back to the, the idea of the narrative uh, and working to do today what we need to do for that future. Uh, and I would say that it is uh, things like the Japanese government, when they stood up and said that they would uh, uh, support the United States uh, if we came to Taiwan's aid, it should the, the PRC launch an invasion or violence against Taiwan. That goes further than any B-21, than any NGAD, uh, than any you know long-range missile defense system that we have. Statements like that from Japan, uh, who are going to be a critical ally. Same thing for Australia, uh, 
Um, and additionally, people ask me what I think the Chinese are more concerned about. And really, I think it's this idea of like the Quad and AUKUS and all these things that tend to knit together the international community uh, and the way in which we're able to, uh, to get our views across and have the international community adopt that. Uh, because China, at the end of the day, I don't think they want to overturn the international world order. They just want an insurance policy against it in case we try to cut them out like we did the Russians out of SWIFT. Uh, but they are perfectly happy operating within what has been status quo, the international world order, because it's been good for China. They just want to have the ability uh, that if push comes to shove and we try to kick them out, that they would have a backup. But I tell people by them having a backup that makes the idea of us kicking them out less likely. Uh, and so as we get people, uh, countries like India, countries like um, Australia and Japan and Korea and, and others around the, uh, around the world to join into multilateral security organization, multilateral trade. TPP is a perfect example of an own goal on our eye, on our end that we should have absolutely seen through. Um, but that is going to make it harder for China to fight against that. Uh, and at the end of the day, hopefully we convince them that it's still more advantageous uh, to them to operate with that, maybe try to change it on the margins, uh, but not completely uh, overthrow it. Um, and uh, I just one last thought that I know this comes up quite a bit when we talk about Taiwan. In my own personal opinion, uh, just based on experience, not based on anything else, uh, I don't feel that if the PLA were to launch an attack and lose, and we can talk about what losing means, and we, my, uh, Ken, Ar Ken Al and I have written an article about the day after the battle, but even if they lose, whatever your conception is, I don't think that is necessarily existential to the PRC or to the PLA uh, or to Xi Jinping even personally. Uh, and so that uh, is uh, certainly not a widely held opinion. There are, you know, there's a whole spectrum of opinion on that, uh, but I don't think that it is necessarily uh, the be all end all and that they have to be that sure that they will be successful to launch that. I think that it's a lower threshold because Taiwan's not moving anytime soon. It's still only gonna be hundred miles off the coast of uh, the mainland. Uh, and the party will be able to use the narrative, use their, their propaganda system, and they literally call it a propaganda system, to propagate their message uh, to combat that and, and perhaps come back 10, 20, 30 years down the road or whatever. So again, happy to be challenged on any of that. Um, uh, so I will turn it first over to our panelists if they have any comments, if there was any crosstalk, if Lucas or Ian wanted to talk about what Drew had to say or vice versa, uh, and then we'll go to uh, some of the questions. Luke, just go ahead. I see your hand up. Thank you, others, Stuart. I, I wanted to add uh, one quick sort of wrinkle to, to what you said, Brandon, which is, um, you know, China's goals when it comes to the current international system. Um, I, I agree with you. I might take it one step further and say um, that China sees the current international system uh, as having been created by basically the United States with some specific allies and partners. And it, the rules and institutions are set up to inherently favor those who created it more than those who were not around or in, present in the room at the time. Uh, and so I think that China, you know, getting past any kind of international relations theory definitions of what a revisionist state is, uh, just more generally speaking, I think that China is basically trying to play the game that they see the U.S. and others playing, which is they want to modify the current international system, its norms, laws, institutions, and standards to be more favorable to its interests. Uh, and it is going to many of the countries, and I think this gets to what, what Drew was saying, which was super interesting to me, uh, to kind of hear an update about Southeast Asian perspectives. But uh, what I see is when we talk about great power competition, and I know, Brendan, we've talked about this before, um, Ultimately, what I think is happening is that China is going to a lot of these other countries um, that feel like they have not benefited from the current world order led by the United States since World War II. They haven't benefited as much as some other countries like the United States and Europe, Japan and others. And China is basically saying to them, uh, you know, you've given the U.S. led system, the liberal democratic system, You've given it a shot for the last 60 years, and it hasn't really worked out great for you, or certainly not as great as it has for the bigger countries. And, you know, China says, China says we've been there, we've been left out as well. Uh, we understand, and we promise you we're going to be, you know, more fair when it comes to economic benefits. They throw some economic bones to these countries as a token of their sincerity, 
Uh, and the problem that the DOD faces is that you know the DOD fundamentally is a security guarantor. And with the exception of Taiwan and maybe one or two other places, no one's actually concerned about China invading. And so when these smaller countries have to choose between economic benefits, dubious, but better than nothing, uh, or national security guarantee, they're inherently going to gravitate towards the economics. So the challenge for DOD is to find the places where there's enough overlap uh, that the DOD presence and assistance will have economic uh, advantages to these countries. Brendan, can I can I weigh in on that just quickly? Honestly, that this is a personal frustration of mine, having served in OSD for a number of years. Every time I hear folks, especially out, no offense, Lucas out in Pacific Command or Indo Pacific Command, talking about all of government and and economics, that's not your job. That's not PACOM's job. You're not going to compete there. This is where you're joining CPTPP, having open market. You know, old school free trade is what the region wants, and DOD is not delivering that, and it's not in a position to deliver it. I mean, what, what DOD needs to do is, is have a CTF, a numbered war plan that's up to date, and a named annual exercise that certifies the CTX on, on the CTF on, on the war plan. Get back to your business of doing your job and preparing to fight. The rest of the government needs to step up. Commerce needs to protect you know, intellectual property. Treasury needs to protect the dollar. Energy needs to deal with technology. It's not really the Department of Energy, it's the Department of Technology. And they all have to play a role and they all have to see the prioritization of Southeast a of, of Taiwan and Northeast Asian security. But, uh, but, but it's, it's the intersection of security and, and economics is, is very thin and it's basically the security provided by by DOD that enables the security but it's other folks who have to I'm sorry the security provided by DOD enables the economic engagement but it's the rest of the US that has to show up with policies the problem is the US can't tell major US companies they can't tell Bechtel to just go plop down in another country with trillions of dollars in in the bank account to go build someone a train that'll never be profitable so we can't compete in the same way. Um, but what you know, we, you, DOD can do in the audience here, you know, from, from the Air Force is think about how are you going to fight? How are you going to fight a really tough, tough problem? And then figure out where the rest of the government fits in. But that's that's really beyond the scope of I think most of the folks who, who are engaged in the, in this discussion. And it's critical, it's critical that that you have the whole government pulling together and not letting interagency uh, slow down the arms sales process, for example. And I think that's something the Biden administration has done well, um, you know, making sure that, that we are a reliable security partner and we're not bundling arms sales to Taiwan to, to reduce friction with China, that we're willing to, to, to push our interests. I mean, there's an economic aspect to that, being open to, to tech transfer and co-development and things like that. So, but again, that's small, small potatoes when we're talking about, about open trade agreements. And, and I, think, I think we have to do better than Indo-Pacific economic framework if we're going to compete in that space. If I can uh, just carry this conversation a little further. So I, I totally agree with you, um, but I want to add a wrinkle to that. So, you know, and I know that some of our mutual friends who have been on the NSC would say, you know, and said many times, you know, the, the DOD, the first thing that DOD should be ready to do is, you know, prepare to execute and win an O plan, right? And, and I totally, totally agree with that. However, there are a couple sort of organizational factors that I think make it hard for the DOD to not, you know, sort of expand their mission and also, you know, contribute, right? So, you know, for example, there's such an overlap now, an increasing overlap, because China sees economics and defense as integrated. And so, you know, there is an inherent connection. But what I would agree even more with you is what should be happening. And also the other part is the DOD is so much bigger and more well-resourced. Mm -hmm. And most DOD people are people of action. You know, we're all prior military, right? So like, we, it's hard to sit there and not see things happen and not try to go and help. And I have certainly at PACOM and other places 
had been, you know, put back in my seat a little bit. I'm like, what? No one, no one realized that every beginning of August, you know, that China lifts a, you know, uni unilateral moratorium on fishing that they use to provoke the South China or the, the um, Senkaku Islands. Uh, and so I'm planning my own con ops, even though that is not my job because no one else is doing it, right? But I think, you know, so a great sort of insight is uh, General Stilwell, right, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia Pacific Affairs from the Trump administration. One star retired general, like, was the defense attache in Beijing. Uh, and so, like, you know, he was through and through, uh, you know, a U.S. DOD Air Force guy. And he went to State Department, and before he left, he was talking about some of the ideas he had about implementing some, you know, practices that we had in the DOD at State Department to, you know, give him a little more structure. Uh, and I think he, he did some of that. But when he came back, you know, he also came back very converted to the idea that State Department are the diplomacy professionals and DOD should absolutely support, but shouldn't lead. And, you know, you look at something like FONOPS, right? The FONOPS program is a State Department program executed by the DOD. So you can understand how there's a lot of sort of blending of responsibility, but I totally agree with you that, you know, we need to rethink how we do that. That's exactly why we do these things so we can get, uh, you know, all these different opinions and backgrounds and, uh, and experiences. So, you know, I, absolutely, uh, we can keep going on that and you can keep uh, throwing the questions in the chat. Uh, both Richard and um, Ryan had a, a similar question, then Ryan's got a follow-on question, but I, I wanted to get uh, uh, some opinions on this. Uh, and it's basically, you know, kind of as China continues to grow uh, and presumably Taiwan's, uh, you know, uh, uh, relative position uh, isn't going to be enhanced greatly militarily or economically, uh, certainly not reverting back to what it was in the 70s where you can say the tables were turned. But as China continues to grow, what should we expect to see from the PRC as they try to leverage that influence, uh, either uh, uh, pre-hostilities or through an invasion uh, or a blockade? So if anybody has any thoughts on exactly what we're, sh what we're expecting to see out of the PRC in the next coming years to decades, um, perfectly willing to hear your thoughts on that. You know, I think uh, it's such a great question, and it's it's so important that we look at a, a variety of scenarios because really, the options open to Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party are really only limited by their own imaginations. I mean, they have the initiative; they know what their ultimate strategic objective is, and that's to actually occupy and control Taiwan. Um, and they have the luxury of of launching the attack at the time, the place, and in the manner of their choosing, and that may not at all look like we what we would assume. It may not be uh, the set piece battle, the amphibious invasion that uh, that so many of us have, have studied and, and written about that we could be caught by surprise. And I think you know we're surprised all the time by what uh, Xi Jinping and, and his colleagues do. I mean, just look at, at the, the dynamic COVID zero policy in Shanghai. Look at what they've done to some of the, the technology ecosystem in China. Um, look at how they've handled um, their own people. I mean, the, the Orwellian mass surveillance program, if you told somebody five years ago that China was going to build concentration camps in Xinjiang and conduct a genocide, though it seen, um, people would have thought you were, you were stark raving mad. I mean, it, it was unthinkable. Not, not that long ago. When people would say, hey, I remember before uh, China successfully tested its anti-satellite missile in uh, early 2007. Um, this is an issue I had been tracking at the time uh, in grad school, and nobody in the arms control community thought they would do what they did. And few have predicted that they would go the way they've gone in outer space and cyberspace and, and other domains as well. Um, and so when we talk about a Taiwan scenario, it, it may look very different than what we expect. And, and Brendan, to your, to your point, um, there, there's a lot of leverage actually that that Beijing has over Taipei. Um, there's a lot of economic leverage. Uh, the Taiwanese economy is very heavily uh, reliant on production centers uh, in China, and so that could be one of the warning signs. Is instead of a, a blockade the way we think of it, quarantine, you know, nineteen the nineteen sixties and Cuba and and ships at sea. Um, 
it could look very different. It could start with an economic blockade where Beijing, and this is just speculative, of course, because we're talking about the future and we need to predict this, um, but just notionally, they could actually nationalize Taiwanese companies like Foxconn uh, that are in China. They could seize the assets of wealthy uh, Taiwanese billionaires. Uh, they could start to change their policy towards um, the Taiwanese business community uh, that travels back and forth uh, straight all the time. So we could see a lot of coercion in that space, and then that escalates on up. Uh, one of the riskiest scenarios I think we face, and, and both Drew and Lucas talked about the, the tremendous trouble we have with uh, Powell Mill, because this is very much a military planning problem, but it's also very, very much a, a political problem and a diplomacy problem, economic problem. Um, one of the challenges that we might face is that it's certainly possible the Chinese Communist Party intelligence services have cultivated politicians in Taiwan. And it is possible one of those politicians could be elected president one day. Um, I remember um, that the 2020 elections, there were a number of candidates who were widely suspected by a number of folks whose opinions I hold very highly. They're widely suspected of having very strong ties to uh, Chinese government and Chinese military intelligence services. And sure enough, in some of their stated policy positions, they seem to be parroting Beijing's talking points. And had things gone differently, and they did in Hong Kong and had Beijing handled the protests in Hong Kong differently than they did, it is theoretically possible the elections would have gone a different way in 2020. And we could have a very different government today in Taipei. And of course, that's true uh, for 2024. That's true for 2028, 2032. You know, it's like every, every four years, the Taiwanese people play Russian roulette with their own sovereignty and democracy. Because if they elect the wrong candidate, because that candidate just happens to be charming or charismatic or off of them, you know, it takes the debate towards economics and not, not, not cross trade relations. Um, it is possible because Taiwanese voters don't always vote along national security lines. In fact, they very rarely do. They're just like everybody else. They, they, they care most about domestic politics and the economy. Um, and so that is something I think that we need to watch. And this is, uh, obviously not a military problem. This is a political military problem. How can the United States of America come up with a strategy to build our own influence in Taiwan, to reassure the Taiwanese um, and to build actually, build American influence and, and prestige um, so that Taiwan's democracy doesn't get crumbled from within um, in a way that we've seen that happen in Hong Kong. We saw that happen to Taiwan's ROC government in the Chinese Civil War. You know, part of it is a kinetic flight, but there's another whole uh, system of weapons that, that China has that are mental. They're invisible, they're clandestine, uh, and they can be very effective. Uh, they have intelligence services that are very different than ours. That we have no equivalent to the United Front Work Department, for example. We have no equivalent to the Strategic Support Force um, and their political warfare bureau. We have nothing like that. And so it makes it very difficult for us to even conceptualize, even be able to see it in our mind's eye, let alone counter it. Uh, and so this is um, this is something I think, in addition to the, the other scenarios, I think something that, that uh, deserves more time and attention as well. Brandon, can I weigh in on something? Just struck me. Many of my conversations that I've had over the years with Taiwan you know, defense planners, folks in the general staff doing their own internal modeling and, and, and assessments, they, they've often sort of, we've talked about blockade and invasion, and, and they've always looked at it as a continuum. And I think that's something that sometimes I don't hear the U.S. always doing, as if, as if a blockade is like an individual activity. And I think the Taiwan see it pretty much the way China does. It's it's part of a continuum of activities basically stretching across the strait, beginning with a blockade, followed by fire strikes, followed by amphibious, triphibious invasion. And, and I think that's, that's an important 
way to look at it that these are not standalone activities. And the same thing for the you know the three war warfares that you're describing: the lawfare, the information warfare. You know, all very much part of a continuum. So you, you get to the point where, I mean, I've been involved in tabletop exercises, fire drills, you know, both with Taiwan, with U.S. only. And it was always struck me that there was almost rarely in the room a consensus on when the war started. As we're modeling and gaming it out, I, I remember remarking to a very senior Taiwan official once, I said, you know, historians will look back and tell us what D-Day was. It's not going to be a very clear June 6th right? The, the boots on the ground are going to be an interim phase, not the start. Um, you know, the, the war will have been initiated long before we, we maybe even recognize it. And, and I think something that struck me with watching Ukraine and, and, and Putin's use of both diplomacy to delay uh, reactions and responses, but also disinformation um, is, is something that I'm sure the Chinese have watched even more closely. And I think in many cases, uh, it's validated some of their assumptions about how they will use those those tools, um, and, and I suspect they'll use them effectively uh, when the time comes. I, one other thought, just to weigh in on, um, again, this has been really stimulating, and I, I always appreciate the chance to, to, to hear other you know, really great experts. Um, will to fight is kind of coming up in this conversation, as, as I think Lucas mentioned it explicitly, uh, but but I think you know, Ian Ian indirectly implied it. And one of the things, and, and I don't have I don't have quantitative data on this, but it strikes me that there's a generational shift occurring in Taiwan, both amongst the population, but also especially amongst the amongst the senior military officials in Taiwan itself. I think if you look at older you know, retired, you know, four-star equivalents, or even some of the serving ones, they're of a previous generation, if you will, who maybe were more affiliated, have a better affinity for, for the, the KMT, uh, the business community, uh, closer connections to the mainland. And, and I think there was a running strain of, of thought. Um, maybe it wasn't front of the brain, could have been back of the brain that, that, that the likelihood of, of a conflict ending in a quick surrender was, was probably higher than we would like to think about. That, that they would put up a fight, save face, take some casualties, but then retire, you know, essentially retire with honor and, and surrender um, and, and basically achieve unification in that way. Um, and, and I think that sentiment is, is aging out of the Taiwan military. The younger one-star generals and, and flag officers that I've met are are not like their their retired four-star equivalents, the, the the full generals who came from a different generation. I think the current crop of officers that are coming to senior positions now are much more nationalistic. They have a much greater sense of identity, and we certainly see this in polling amongst Taiwanese population, but I think it's reflected in the officer corps as well. They, they see the necessity of defending their homeland. They see, the, they see the consequences of being unable to defend their homeland. I think that's another lesson of Ukraine. It's not a coincidence that, that you know, Taiwan's foreign minister, Joseph Wu, put in a phone call to the mayor of Busha, I think yesterday. Yeah, you know, why is he calling the mayor of Busha? Because they suffered some pretty traumatic and horrific atrocities at the hands of an occupying invader. And, and I think what he's doing is sending a message to his own people that, you know, the analogies are not perfect between Ukraine, Russia, and Taiwan, and China, but the consequences of not being able to defend your family, your home, are, are, are very serious. And, and that's not something that you heard older generations talk about. The goal was always unification, but the current leadership, the current political dynamic, the current public sentiment, I think is increasingly reflected. And, and this gets to that will to fight, which I think is, in, is, is much, much greater than it has been um, in perhaps in Taiwan's history. And I think that's worth noting. And I think that gives the US confidence or should give the US confidence in making its commitments to Taiwan's defense. Um, I, I forgot if Ian or Lucas mentioned it, but that was another really important point though, is the trust gap between senior Taiwan military officials and US officials. I mean, I mean, I had great working relationships with my counterpart. I mean, I'm still in touch with many of them today. I mean, I felt very appreciated 
But at the same time, I mean, and, and they're, they're some of the best partners I think you could hope for. But at the same time, I think they're frustrated. They're frustrated that they don't have choices. They're, they're basically stuck with the U.S. as a security partner without, without options. There's, there's no hedging possible. And I think that frustrates them. And then again, I think U.S. reliability. Uh, when you know, arms aren't delivered on time, it throws off all of their work, throws off their planning. If they can't, you know, if they can't count on equipment being delivered or, or approved, then, then it's frustrating for them. It makes it harder for them to do their jobs, and, and it makes them increasingly frustrated with the U.S. So I think the U.S. being a reliable partner is incredibly important if we want to maintain that, that will to fight and the ability to fight and to plan and to be effective. And it benefits us even more than it benefits them because it, it, it addresses that trust gap. And that trust gap runs deep. I mean, it runs back to 1979, which Taiwan military officers call the, the abandonment um, uh, when the US switched recognition and, and abrogated the mutual defense treaty. And I think that's also underlying some of the frustrations that the that, that Taiwan public politicians and military officers feel is the lack of security that comes from a mutual defense treaty, the lack of recognition affects their, their, their dignity. Um, and, and because of that, it reflects their perception of us. So the thing also to remember is Taiwan is important to the U.S. for a lot of reasons, and it's been well articulated by, by Eli Ratner and, and Dan Crittenbrink and other key, key administration officials. But it's also a really important litmus test for U.S. credibility in the region. I think if you talk to Japanese, Australia, New Zealand, you pick your ally, they look at how we handle Taiwan as, as a yardstick a yardstick for our credibility, our commitment, our reliability, and our willingness to stand up to China, which again, fewer other countries are willing to do, but it demonstrates that we'll stand behind our word. And that makes it a really, really important uh, partner for us, uh, even more so than just it is, it is in its own right. Um, and that's not often articulated, but I think it needs to be understood. How we handle Taiwan really matters in terms of maintaining the alliance network that we have in the region. So, uh, Drew, if I can ask a question to you, um, I agree with all of that, but again, that's where I see some organizational obstacles, right? So, I mean, one of the reasons that I think the United States is seen as unreliable and unpredictable is because of the democratic process of, you know, changing administrations, changing priorities, et cetera. And so, you know, from, from your perspective and sort of certainly your experience at the Pentagon, do you have any thoughts about some of the ways that the U.S. can be more assuring and reassuring, given sort of the institutional constraints of our, our processes? I mean, that, that's a great, a great question. Um, I mean, I think the most important thing is that, you know, we have to continue to be us, right? I mean, we have to be true to ourselves, true to our values, and, and that makes it hard, right? I mean, it's it, this is no different than, say, the challenges, the you know, academic community and universities faced when dealing with, you know, Chinese STEM graduates coming for, for high level graduate training, right? Do we stay open and academic or do we protect our technology? So I think we have to, we have to really focus on our values, not try to out, out China the Chinese. Um, I think we need to, um, but also be much more empathetic and, and recognize what do they need to succeed? Because at the end of the day, for Taiwan to succeed, they have to be better warfighters. They have to be able to contribute to their own defense. I mean, that's the great offset. The more that Taiwan does, the more capability it leaves us to, to, to fight as well. So we have to think about what do we do to make them better? Um, and that can be things like being more reliable, more open, uh, being very engaged in joint planning processes and then backing up very carefully our, our, our commitments. I, I think the fact that the U.S. changes government every four years or every eight years is baked in. Everybody knows that's what you get when you deal with the U.S. Um, and, and that's not going to change for, for, for nobody and nor should it. Um, but I, I think there's ways that we can be credible um, by simply being more reliable by, and, and in areas where it's hard to be reliable, you can't predict when bureaucratic processes will, will conclude. It's very, very difficult to, to plan coordinating processes, especially when you're dealing with anything related to China, which you know, essentially is a tier zero decision almost every time. So how 
do you sort of provide that that credibility when you can't really even control your own timelines? And the answer is just smoother communications, better communications, commitment, appointing people who are dedicated and responsible and energetic to to engage counterparts with authority so that they understand you know what the challenges are internally as well as you know what we're trying to achieve so that we're we're working in lockstep um you know the worst thing you can do is is to be opaque and say no decision's been made and 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 not have them understand if if that means the decision's never going to be made uh effectively no or is it simply still stuck in the bureaucratic process that's going to require you know a cabinet level meeting which is difficult to schedule uh so so i think being able to communicate to them builds trust and it's not something we've always done done well sometimes we we sort of we 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 hunker down in our respective bunkers and sort of shoot faxes at each other and that doesn't always build you know the trust and and the respect that i think the the bilateral relationship needs and requires and and and, and justifiably should have Notice that you know in some of the conversations I've had both in USG as well as with the Taiwan M and D folks, um, you know Taiwan M and D folks, one probably the same for you, but one of their regular themes, including recently, has been more information sharing. Although it tends to be more intel sharing, uh, and so having seen this sort of from both sides, one of the constraints which I, I've seen the Taiwans get a little bit touchy about, understandably, um, is the idea that there's some issues with us trusting, you know, the security of the information that we pass them. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really hard sometimes to know what are we willing to, what information are we willing to risk in the name of building trust, right? And I, I think that is an internal USG dilemma that is often, you know, debated. And, and that's probably part of the inconsistency is sometimes the, the decision-making machine uh, for the DOD says it's worth it and sometimes not, but from the uh, exterior that there may not be as obvious logic or, or even if there isn't any logic, it might be, you know, it seems very inconsistent. I don't know. Do we have any disclosure officers on this call? Um, they're not always as accountable to policy as one might like. They operate in their own little silo, protecting U.S. national interests in, in, in the best way they can. Um, it's a dilemma, but it's a dilemma we face with all of our allies. I think, I think there was a period, call it 10, 15 years ago, where there were real questions about the integrity of Taiwan's system, but they had a couple of shocks to the system and, and really addressed them. I think they really stepped up their counterintelligence efforts. They really began um, much better background checks, much better reporting. They cut back on travel to the mainland. They increased reporting requirements. They increased polygraphs. So I think they really stepped up their game to rebuild trust with the US after a couple of scandals. Um, and I think that enabled the, the pipeline to open a bit broader. But to, to turn, turn things around a bit, one of the opportunities that I think Taiwan can take more advantage of is sharing its own intel and its own um, uh, intelligence, electronic, human, whatever, with not just the US, but other potential partners, Japan in particular, which doesn't have as robust a capability as the US does. Um, I mean, in some cases, if Taiwan is going to provide analysis of, of something going on across the strait with the US, it's going to be corroborating. But for Japan, it might be actually quite valuable, for example. So I think increasingly the, the future of Taiwan sharing is going to be its sensors being more connected to, to, to US um, cops, for example. I mean, my, my dream has always been essentially if we're going to integrate and, and, and especially for you know, friends in the US Air Force listening here, you know, if we're talking about standoff capabilities, we're still going to need to have sensors that are closer in. And those are Taiwan. So how do you integrate a Taiwan sensor with a US shooter? so that you can fight from standoff distances and still discriminate targets. I'm not going to get into that kill chain business. That's, that's, that's not a policy function that I was comfortable with, but, but other people know how to do that. And I think the trick is how do, you, how do you create better connectivity? How do you make sure that Taiwan is part of a Link 22 consortium so that they're interoperable with the US? Um, how do you get Taiwan to feed more info? I mean, I, I've always felt that Taiwan uh, military intelligence on, Taiwan, on Chinese uh, PLA exercises has been really quite good. 
Um, and, and I think something that, that perhaps, you know, you and Paycom colleagues have valued. I've been in the room when they've said, wow, this is good. We really, you know, glad to get your take on whatever you know, exercise that the PLA just pulled off. And I don't think they were, they were, you know, I don't think they were shining them on. I think they were being genuine that this was good analysis. And that's a, that's a competitive advantage that Taiwan has. So it's a two-way street to build that trust. Um, but I, I think the, the time, like I said, 15 years ago, you know, you could say that Taiwan was a sieve and you might've been right. I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, and, and not just because of the controls they put in place, but I think also because attitudes are changing. I think it's because there is less interplay, there's less travel, there's, there's less, I think, desire to be part of China. I mean, even, you know, even my friends who are, you know, hard KMT, you know, 20 years ago, they would have been talking about unification being to, to Taiwan's benefit. I think today it's a different tune. They don't want to give up their freedoms. They don't want to be under, under essentially that communist rule. It's not attractive. And, and they're watching it certainly, uh, to Ian's point about the elections, they're watching it closely on things like, like Hong Kong. And that makes it increasingly unlikely that, that Taiwan will uh, elect a, a leader who's advocating for, for some form of confederation with China if it results in, in, in some very negative potential scenarios, whether it's simply the erosion of autonomy, whether it's you know, increased surveillance, or at worst, you know, complete assimilation, which might look more like, like Xinjiang, um, where you've got large numbers of people being detained for political crimes. Um, uh, and then again, I, I mentioned, you know, it's not a coincidence that, that the foreign minister is talking to Ukrainian cities that have emerged from occupation of, of even worst case scenarios, where absolute atrocity is being committed against your population by a foreign power. Um, so I think the desire to, to, to somehow fix the relationship, um, you know, to somehow smooth the unification of the two sides by sharing data. I, I think that that era is kind of gone. I don't, I don't think that's the idealism that, that Chinese generals with access to classified data feel anymore. They're not looking about, you know, in the 1970s, maybe you had, you know, senior Taiwan officers retiring to the mainland and, and being well cared for and, and pensioned. And, and I, that, that's no longer the case, but it is something that Taiwan has to continue to monitor and build trust. But I, I think they've they've made really good investments in that in that sector. Well, this has been fantastic as always, and uh, I'm super glad we got everybody here. We've got about ten minutes left, and there's two questions in the chat which are uh, very similar. So uh, Ryan and Johnny are asking about, hey, what we saw in uh, Ukraine that surprised Putin, or at least we think surprised Putin, uh, was the degree to which uh, the European Union and the West came together in, in their their reaction, their negative reaction uh, directly. You know, one can think sanctions and things like that on Russia. So, uh, you know, what do we think? Uh, U.S. companies, specifically, who have big investments uh, in China and want to be in that market, who are already there. Um, you know, what are their reactions going to be in a possible invasion uh, or, or blockade scenario? Uh, and then, uh, you know, certainly Drew touched on this, but, you know, maybe some more, some detailed thoughts on what do you think the region would be? So we'll start with Ian, uh, then we'll go to Lucas, we'll close with Drew. So just thoughts on, you know, what would be, what if any, uh, you know, and no reaction is a reaction. So what if any would the reactions be if something similar happened uh, that happened in Ukraine were to happen to Taiwan? What do you think we uh, and our partners and allies and friends around the world would do? Uh, I, I love it. I think it's, it's a fantastic question. It's an important question. Um, one of the things to bear in mind is that the PRC economy, quite literally an order of magnitude more powerful than the Russian. And so is their population. It's literally an order of magnitude larger, it's 10 times larger. Um, we have a very, very close relationship with the PRC. In, in all domains, and especially in trade and economics. And so does everybody else. To Drew's point, uh, China has done a fantastic job of using predatory economics, state-driven uh, economic policies to infiltrate, um, and in many cases, to hold hostage governments uh, around the region in Southeast Asia and, and increasingly around the world. It's one of the concerns uh, that I think we would have as a country, one of our national security vulnerabilities actually is that what we're doing to Putin today, what we're doing to Russia today, 
could actually be turned against us. So our own weapons, um, you know, the economic warfare sanctions could actually be used against us. Because if you look at uh, the fundamental nature of, of this PRC trade, we rely on China for our pharmaceuticals, for our antibiotics. Uh, we rely on China a lot for our N95 masks and our personal protective equipment, surgical gowns, you, you name it. Everything that, that became a matter of life and death for families all across America during the COVID-19 pandemic, it all comes from China. If you go to Best Buy today, and you want to buy a smart TV, TCL is the most competitive brand. Well, that brand is, has a very close relationship with the PLA. If you want to buy a desktop or a laptop, it's Lenovo. No question, hands down, they are the best product for the price point. But again, Lenovo has a relationship with the PLA, uh, which is why they've been blacklisted by DOD. Same is true of drones, same is true of um, security systems, and, uh, and even for white goods, you know, our, our smart appliances that connect to the internet of things. Um, those are now mainly supplied by a state-owned enterprise. So GE Home has actually been bought by Hire, which is quite literally an arm of the Chinese government. Uh, and so I live in Northern Virginia. When I go to my grocery store, I see Lenovo. When I go to the, the hospital, you know, if I take my kids to see the doctor, it's Lenovo. All of our personal and private data is going into Chinese Communist Party machines, and machines that could have. This is also true of our, our basic infrastructure. Uh, the digital radios that police departments and fire departments use, that hotel chains use, oil rigs use, uh, oil refineries, um, and, and of course, you know, the facilities, for example, that use EPMC uh, cranes, the smart cranes, the gantry cranes for loading and offloading container ships. Uh, that, again, is a Chinese state-owned enterprise with a very close relationship with the Chinese military. Uh, and so I think this is something that we need to think through uh, to the best of our ability, and it's going to be very, very tough, uh, but to make sure that if there is a crisis, we can't be held hostage. I think we're worried about our allies and partners being held hostage, and we know many of them will be. Uh, and potentially could turn on us uh, or stay uh, neutral, very, very neutral, and very cold to us uh, in this kind of scenario. But I think we also have to worry about our own companies. Our own companies are, they're, in, they're in a terrible position. They're in, in a situation where they could be held hostage. And their job is not to do what Wall Street, uh, or excuse me, what, what Washington tells them to do. Their job is to make a profit. Their job is to answer to their shareholders. And so you could very well see Fortune 50 companies uh, lobbying the U.S. government very, very hard not to defend Taiwan or to limit any response that we had. Um, and we could have scenarios, uh, and I know some of these have been explored in the past, where actually we become subject to Chinese sanctions and they could, they could impact every facet of American life down to our, our hospital system. Um, and that could become an issue of blackmail. We could actually theoretically be successfully blackmailed into, um, into choosing a course of action that we otherwise would not choose. Um, and so this is a significant problem that we face. Uh, but again, it's, it's not a necessarily or even primarily a military problem, although it does affect military outcomes. Uh, it's a national security problem. It's a whole of government problem. Uh, and it's one I think the, the administration is really struggling with right now. I think it's going to be a long-term campaign to try to make sure we can maximize whatever economic advantages we have, whatever leverage we have, and then to over time uh, minimize Beijing's ability to coerce us and to coerce our allies and partners. And it's a very tough problem, but it's, I think, very closely related to, to this scenario. Uh, mindful of time. I'll just make one point and then uh, have Drew finish it up. So the, the one point I want to make, I agree largely with what Ian said, but what struck me the most was on how many companies on their own initiative weaponized their private corporations, Starlink being obviously the most obvious one. Um, but that has really important implications in part for West and you know the Western values of non-combatant immunity, of discrimination, just war theory, international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions. We have just blurred the line of what are legitimate targets. 
Now, one could argue that China has long been doing that, uh, and they have, they don't, it doesn't generally differentiate between these, uh, and I would agree with that. But that doesn't mean that the act of the U.S. endorsing that kind of behavior, although very effective, uh, that might further exacerbate uh, this you know, potential humanitarian and ethical dilemma. So, Drew, please. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll keep this short. I agree pretty much with everything that's been said. I mean, in a Taiwan scenario, you 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 really can't isolate China economically. You, we won't get the world to do it the way we sort of could with Russia. I mean, even there, it was a challenge. Uh, our effort to cut China off from global financial networks, like Ian said, might backfire. But you run the risk of the U.S. being cut off, isolating ourselves. Uh, for instance, like driving uh, the renminbi is to be used as trade settlement uh, currency. Uh, but on the U.S. companies piece, it's a really good question, and it, and it's you know much like universities you know uh, around the world who are dependent on 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 Chinese students or tourism industry, for example. I think U.S. companies are increasingly wary about China, but not just because of Taiwan, but really about other factors as well. And I think that kind of works in works in our favor. Um, in, in the political risk industry, you'd call Taiwan a, a low probability, high impact scenario. Uh, whereas I think the, the, the high probability current scenario is that you've got rising costs. You've got the increasingly unlevel playing field with the role of the party. You've got um, uh, uh, state nationalism. You've got obviously the you know, dynamic co zero COVID policies making it impossible to visit. I, I think China is becoming a tougher and tougher market to invest in harder to do business in, harder to make profits in. And that's leading to diversification. You can call it decoupling, but I mean, China is actively seeking to decouple or right? dual circulation policies, effectively a Chinese resiliency program uh, to increase foreign markets dependency on China for their own leverage while reducing their own lever uh, dependency on foreign markets. So, so I think some of those trends are already occurring that have nothing to do with Taiwan, uh, but, but clearly, you know, businesses are um, uh, heavily invested in China. Um, again, it's not the world's largest economy for nothing. Um, you have to be there if you're a major a major company, regardless of how patriotic you are. Uh, if, if you're going to be a global company, you're going to have to have a footprint in China. You're going to have to try to access that market. You're going to have to support your clients um, in, in that market. So you know, we can't just shift to a containment strategy. Um, and I think that's always been an underlying problem for U.S. administrations, uh, particularly since Xi Jinping has come to power and become more, more assertive and more aggressive. Without that sort of clear end state of a containment policy that everyone agrees to, it's very hard to craft a strategy towards China, uh, incorporating Taiwan into, into your defense plans uh, that doesn't have an end state that's clear, concise, uh, that, that's more about balancing interests and, and you know, managing cooperation, or, or in the case of now, I think it's really preventing an even worse scenario than the one we have now. So, so the, the economic piece is definitely key. But last thought, of course, you know, global capital is going to move to to where it can be successful, you know, where it can make the best returns uh, on on the investment. And as long as that's China, it's going to be there. As China becomes a worse destination for investment, it's going to spread out. To, to other places, and that could be Eastern Europe, that could be Southeast Asia, uh, and I think that diversification will provide a little more resiliency to potential shocks in Northeast Asia. I'll stop there. Well, gentlemen, this has been fantastic. It's uh, great to see all of you at, uh, at some point. Hopefully, we'll all get together in the same hemisphere, at least, uh, for a beer or a Mai Tai or a sling, depending on uh, who's hosting the next round. But uh, on behalf of Cassie and on behalf of uh, ACC, our partners, uh, I would like to thank you again for taking the time out of your busy days uh, you know, all across the world here uh, to spend some time with us and to talk through these issues. And uh, I look forward to the next installment. So. Uh, thank you uh, to all of our uh, ACC folks out there. I appreciate you sticking with us uh, and we will see you again next quarter. Thank you very much.